sponsored by Squarespace. This is an unpunished copy of Mordheim Streets of the Damned. And according to legends, it's the best game Games Workshop ever made. Mordheim is my favorite game of all time. I love everything about the game. So today we're gonna explore what makes the game so good. And how in the world can a start collecting box of this game, containing only half of the miniatures, fetch as much as $300 on eBay? And at the end of it, figure out why, if the game was so good, did Games Workshop stop selling the game? Even way before Games Workshop started producing their now gigantic franchises, Warhammer 40,000, Age of Sigmar, and Lord of the Rings, Games Workshop made board games. Somewhat early favorites that are still being talked about are games such as Hero Quest, Space Crusade, Space Hulk, Space Marine, lots of space in there, Warhammer Quest, Talisman, and Blood Bowl. And some of these games are still up to this day getting new remakes every five years or so. But the one game that fans revere as probably the best game that Games Workshop ever made was made in 1999, and that is Mordheim. And to simplify it, it's pretty much the fantasy version of Necromunda. The game takes place in Mordheim, a once thriving city as the capital of Ostermark. A name that's probably akin to the Swedish name Östermark, which pretty much means East Land. That in the imperial year of 1999, yes, it's the same year as the year that it was released, but in a different timeline, so about 500 years before Warhammer Fantasy. The city got hit by a giant meteor of warp stone, and that in its turn laid waste to the entire city, except for that one monastery by Sisters of Sigmar that was protected by Sigmar himself because it was 1999 and the world was going bonkers. The Mayan calendar ends in the year 2000. There is gonna be the Y2K bug. All the computers are gonna die. So we came up with the idea of a localized apocalypse. And we as players are thrown into that time in that city where all kinds of war bands, treasure hunters, where this local apocalypse have taken place to find all manners of wealth and Warpstone. And Warpstone, it's one of the most valuable possessions you can have, as it is a magical element manifested in physical form. And if you are in possession of Warpstone, it can make a normal person into a magic wielder. And if you're a wizard, you can become even stronger. And to me, it's just fantastic how Games Workshop managed to pack so much personality in such a small city in an otherwise gigantic world. No other game looks like it. My great ally on this was, of course, uh, legendary John Blanche. It's very dark, grim. It's the setting. It's the ruined fantasy skirmish. It's the, it really started that whole trend. I think what makes Mordheim so good is it's a combination of a narrative game and a tabletop war game. The core of the game itself, even if it's a war game, it's not to defeat your enemy, even if you're probably quite often going to come to that point. The core itself is to find as much possible of this warp stone. You start a game with 500 gold crowns to build and recruit your warband consisting of heroes and henchmen. And much like in role-playing games, your characters gain experience and improve as the game goes on. You can also buy gear for your members or recruit even more members throughout the game. The tone of the game is great. It's really dark and it's really funny. Mordheim sort of feels like if Games Workshop gave the best of the best creators working for them, permission to let loose and create whatever they thought was cool. I love everything about the game. The setting, the warbands, the rules, the feeling. And speaking about things to love, let's talk about this honestly amazing sponsor of this week's video. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform where you as a creator can make your own website to showcase your creativity, talent, service or product. I've been using Squarespace for about four years now and it's such a convenient platform to use for making your own website if you don't have any programming knowledge. They have so many amazing looking award-winning templates and it's super easy to create your own gallery or maybe even an entire web shop to sell your own product. It is completely free to try out. You can try to build your own website and if you're happy with it and you're ready to launch the website then you can use the code SQUIDMAR to get 10% off. I will put the link to squarespace.com slash SQUIDMAR down in the video description and I can totally recommend all the creatives out there to just do your own thing and showcase your art on the internet. But now let's get back to more time.
When the game was first released, there was a total of six factions. Undead, Witch Hunters, Sisters of Sigmar, Skaven, The Possessed, and lastly, Mercenaries that itself had three sub-factions based on where they came for, Reichland, Middenheim, and Marienburg. And one of Games Workshop's all-time most popular factions are the Orcs, but they are not featured. And despite their popularity, Thomas decided not to include them in the game, because in Warhammer during those editions, the orcs were depicted as quite goofy, and they really wanted to keep the atmosphere of the game consistent, keeping it grim, dark, and gritty. And the orcs just wouldn't fit with that. So instead of looking at what Warhammer and Warhammer 40k looked like at that time, Thomas went back to the first generation of Warhammer Fantasy. And it really went back to the, the Warhammer Fantasy roleplay and that early dark grim, which really where the grimness of the 40k originally came from. It drew from the Warhammer's initial darkness. On top of the original unit members that you could select for your warbands, there were hired swords and mercenary, a concept that Games Workshop even to this day are implementing in some of their games such as Age of Sigmar with the Giants. And one of the coolest things where they implemented rules based on the lore in the books of Mordheim is that if you were hiring an elf for your warband and then decided to add a dwarf as well, these two would hate each other immensely and it would give you penalties for having both elves and dwarves in the same warband. In a campaign I played in, in one of the very first games, one of my dwarves shot a Skaven Nightrunner off a tower. That night runner survived, but they got a broken leg, and running is sort of what night runners do best. So from that point on, that night runner was nicknamed Hobbles. But Hobbles rose to the top. Nothing could kill Hobbles, and Hobbles could kill everything. And everyone was scared of it, and it got to the point that people were putting ransoms on Hobbles' head that haven't even fought against Hobbles yet. But all of this doesn't really go deep in explaining why this was the best game Games Workshop ever made. So I'd like to go a little bit deeper. The setting, it's the ruined fantasy skirmish. It's the, it really started that whole trend. And you've seen that in Frostgrave, a couple other games. And a lot of games refer to them now as Mordheim-like. Nobody offers anything similar, so it, it wins by default if people want that experience. When the dice are unkind to you in Mordheim, no matter how well you prepared everything, it's a couple of crippling injuries to your main heroes. It's the, can really, really like the lay waste to your yeah. uh, the, the warband. Mordheim was really built on a level of randomness that I don't think most games now would tolerate, and maybe most gamers wouldn't either. Mordheim was a very fickle game. It was brutal. You could have warbands you really love suddenly get destroyed. So with this, there would be some real stakes in your games, meaning if you would pretty much just upgrade one character and just max him out with gear, and he would then for some reason die, you would be left with some subpar members in your nice. warband, and it would become a lot more difficult to play. So every decision you made had some real weight to it. Another huge part for Mordheim's success was its accessibility. With Warhammer 40k you needed a huge amount of models and with Warhammer Fantasy even more so. To play Goblins or Skaven you probably needed 200 models. And you could either buy a starter set like this one with two warbands and a bunch of terrain to get you started right off the bat. Or you could just buy a set of miniatures, pretty much whatever you like, and convert them and make them into your own warband. You could tell your own story, create your own narrative with your own miniatures, either with as much effort as you want or with as little monetary investment as you wanted. Games Workshop even had a full page just showing people how you could convert your own models and customize them into your own. I don't think you'd ever see Games Workshop including full pages just showing how to convert and customize your own models in a rulebook today. Which is just fantastic for accessibility. A lot of the Mordheim games were played with these cardboard slash plastic kits that you got in the start collecting boxes, but a lot of it was also played with homemade terrain made of cardboard boxes. And this as well was something that Games Workshop talked a lot about in their books at that time. They even had a specific book made for only this purpose. And I believe that this specifically is what made people take it to heart to really start making their own terrain and gaming tables. And my friend Frederick has definitely taken this to heart. Throughout the years he's built countless of epic Mordheim gaming tables. Even if these days he mostly 3D prints his homes. You have to invest some time and energy into making a game board for Mordheim. The game is all about hiding, climbing, and like attacking each other from unexpected areas and places. So be sure to make a lot of trade pieces. 
And then we have Trent from Miscast, who we met earlier in this video. He custom builds his stuff, and some of them are just truly remarkable. And this is something you can find throughout the Mordheim community. We can just take this video as an example where I went to the Facebook group and asked if people had some stuff they wanted me to share in the video, and the response was overwhelming, and I just saw so many fantastically beautiful terrain builds. You've already seen some of them in this video, and I'm gonna try to link to all of these guys in the video description, but I probably forgot one or two of them. In combination with that, Games Workshop had some of the most creative and unique miniatures they've ever done in this game. Very similar to what they're doing now with Warhammer Underworlds, where the warbands are the best miniatures they release pretty much every year. And one of these is actually a miniature that I own myself. I think it's my favorite elf of Games Workshop's lines. Ever. And it was part of a white dwarf release. They had town scryers, rare heroes, funny townsfolk, witches, and much, much more. And I think that all of this that we have been talking about so far in this video is combined what makes Mordheim so good. The combination of wargaming, role playing, building your warband, having an outlet for your creativity, having the sense of accomplishment when you finally succeed with something after your warband had hit after hit after hit. The fact that the game wasn't based on min-maxing your army, but to tell your own story, both in playing and being creative. And most importantly, how accessible it was. That you didn't need to have thousands of dollars to be able to build your army, 30, 40 bucks and a bunch of cardboard boxes would be way enough. All this made it a game worth remembering. I think it's been about a year and a half since I played Mordheim last, but like the legends of it live on even when we're not playing. In 2004, Games Workshop stopped supporting the game. And in 2010, the game was finally removed completely from its websites. But the game very much lives on still to this day. And it's got the best sub-community of any Warhammer game ever made. And since Games Workshop don't support the game anymore, the community have taken the lead in it. Developing new rules, new scenarios, new rules for warbands, and have kept doing so over the past 20 years. Because Games Workshop never had a plan to support the game long term. They already have their two main cash cows, which at that time was Warhammer Fantasy, and Warhammer 40k, and of course Lord of the Rings. In all honesty, I think Mordheim was supported far longer than it was supposed to just because it was such a hit among the fans and because the team itself was so excited to continuously support the game. So, will I ever punch these sprues from the rare start collecting box to build a warband from them? Honestly, I don't know. There are so many new miniatures made that are awesome that I can bring into the game, and I kind of like having this box unused. But I am insanely excited to build my own gaming table for Mordheim, especially now after I made this video because I've just had so much more inspiration come to me, and I hope you felt the same. If you guys want to see us build some awesome Mordheim stuff, then guys, let us know in the comment section. With that, I would like to thank all of our awesome patrons for supporting this channel. Without you guys, we would not be able to do this every week, make a new video about the hobby that we love so much. If you guys want to help out, we put all of the links to the stuff we use in videos, such as paint and brushes in the video description, or you can support us on Patreon, pledging a few dollars every month. With that said though, guys, have a great day. Bye bye.